Welcome. Today we're going to talk about a collaborative project between FEMA and ERISA's GIS score, where we work to adjust building footprints in the aftermath of Hurricane Laura. I'm Kim Stevens. I'm with FEMA. We also have Omri Shafir from FEMA, Peyton Samuels from Esri, and Aaron Arkinson from ERISA GIS score. I'm going to turn it over to Omri. Omri, can you give us some background on this project? Yes, uh, thank you, Kim. Um, big part of our operation is uh, doing initial damage assessment on structure hit by a uh, disaster, the hurricane or wildfires. Uh, there are many ways to, to do so. Uh, one promising way is using uh, artificial intelligence on post-event imagery. Um, in order to reduce the processing time to deliver rapid result, uh, we need to actually identify the buildings on the ground or identify the building footprints um, on the ground before the event. So uh, FEMA and Oak Ridge National Lab for the past five years are working on developing an algorithm to uh, process and, uh, and produce uh, building footprints for every structure in the continental United States. Um, I think the project is about to end in a few months and we will, be able, we will have national coverage. Um, but like this, this process is using uh, linear segmentation and uh, satellite images, mostly Worldview 3. Um, but with like any other artificial, intelli artificial intelligence process, it, does, it has its errors and challenges. And as you can see in this slide, uh, the major challenges uh, that we see in this model is uh, wrong outline classification you see at the center of the picture, buildings that are not fully covered by the footprint, uh, some missing buildings that the linear segmentation didn't catch. And if you can see, there are some overlapping polygons and that can create geometry, invalid geometry or some topology issues that can hinder the AI results for the damage assessment. Uh, so uh, last hurricane season in 2020, uh, Hurricane Laura hit the coast of Louisiana and Texas, mainly Louisiana, in September 2020. Um, soon after, after landfall, uh, we assigned a civil air patrol to collect post-event images in order to do the damage assessment. Uh, civil air patrol flew and provided us high resolution imagery so we can take this imagery and combine it with the building footprints. However, uh, there were thousands of buildings that I have shown in the previous slides that weren't collected or were a little bit skewed. We had to take care of the geometry of the building footprints. Uh, we didn't have too much time uh, and we needed to provide an answer pretty fast. So we thought about harnessing the crowdsourcing in order, in order for them to go in and change the geometry of the building footprints of the USA structure. Awesome, thank you, Omri. That's a really good summary of the problem. Um, to solve the problem with crowdsourcing, we first had to identify a partner, and we identified Eurysis GIS score to partner with us. And we um, looked to them because they have hundreds of geospatial professionals as part of their organization, and they volunteer to work on discrete tasks. Uh, we can ask Aaron as to kind of why volunteers uh, often volunteer their time, but they, you know, want to build their skills or they enjoy the challenge. They just are just want to help. But crowdsourcing, if you're not familiar with it, the, the basic definition is you're just harnessing the power of a crowd to work on a discrete task. And the fact that it is something that can be done online is even better. And in this instance was the perfect opportunity for us to engage a large group of people, um, not only because of COVID, but because many people can work during all hours of the day, you don't have to be in the same room to accomplish this task. So with that, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we used good project planning methods to get this completed. Um, when you're asking a large group of people to accomplish any, anything, you really need a good project plan to start with. So we had to outline the scope as what Omri just described, you know, what's the problem you're trying to solve? What do we need to accomplish and why? We needed to understand how long this was gonna take, um, identify that partner and make sure that they could assist given those requirements. How are we gonna accomplish this? What are we gonna use to, what platform are we gonna use to interact with those volunteers? Um, 
where is it going to be hosted? How is it going to be secured? All of those problems that we needed to solve in order to even begin. Um, we had to enlist the help of some contract support to help build out that page. And that's why you're going to hear from Peyton here in a second. And in, in addition, there were things that we had to do to assist the, the volunteers, including um, explainer videos and frequently frequently asked questions, because when you have a large group of people, you can guarantee you're going to have questions as to what they need to do and questions about the software, you're going to have glitches. So you need that reach back opportunity, you need to have um, a good clear instruction, otherwise people will abandon the project if it's too complicated or if they're not understanding what they're supposed to accomplish. So with that, I'm actually going to turn over to Aaron Arkison from your SSGIS card. Erin, will you tell us a little bit about your organization? Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Kim. GIS Corps, your SSGIS Corps, um, we have thousands of uh, geospatial volunteers stationed all over the United States, all over the world. And so typically what would happen is a partner agency, in this case, the FEMA contacted us with, with their issue um, with the building footprints. And you know, after uh, talking with FEMA about about what they needed, what the end pro what the end goal would be, and how quickly that they would be to have this done, you know, GIS Corps uh, Corps Committee decides how and how many of the recruitments we're going to send out. So with the crowdsourcing one, uh, crowdsourcing projects, we would send out you know the recruitment to potentially thousands of people. We usually try to take re, uh, make sure that it's more of a regional thing. So in this case, mostly just the U.S. Uh, U.S. volunteers and ones that would have ArcGIS online experience, and then send out the recruitment, and then they would respond back that says, "Yes, I'm available," and and sign up so that we can then forward with the project. And so it really helps with that pre-project planning from from the partner agency, because when we have the right information to pass along to the volunteers and they understand how important a project like this building footprints is, uh, you know, they want to jump on board quick and get it done. Awesome. Thank you for that explanation. And also thank you for all the help that you guys provided us. Um, I'd You're like welcome. actually to turn it to Peyton. Peyton, can you walk us through a little bit about um, how we used a hub site to accomplish this task? Yeah, sure. The team first developed an editing app using RGS Web App Builder. Uh, to divide the work into manageable tasks, this app included a grid of tiles that volunteers could check out uh, and indicate the tile status. They could then go into the tile and edit the building outlines once all of the buildings in that tile had been checked, they could mark the tile as complete and move on to the next. This process helped divide the work, but it also eliminated duplication of effort. As you can see, we provided some clear instructions in the application, but we also needed a way for volunteers to easily access this app. So it was embedded on a new secure page in FEMA's Geospatial Resource Center, which is an ArcGIS hub site. This site also provided a location for robust instructions and guidelines. Uh, we even created an instructional video in case people didn't want to read these instructions. Um, and uh, based on uh, previous experience that URISA has with working with volunteers, they knew that uh, kind of preemptively outlining some potentially frequently asked questions would save us a lot of uh, back and forth communication and Q&A during the project. So we included um, potential uh, questions and answers to make things easier. Peyton, one of the things that surprised me um, during the project was the fact that volunteers really enjoy seeing their names on a leaderboard and understanding um, kind of who's doing the most work, uh, tracking success, you know, if you will, but also in, in a sort of a gamified way. Can you talk a little bit about how we, how we 
enabled the user to see who was doing what and who was who was doing the most footprints. Yeah, definitely. So within the, the ArcGIS Web App Builder application, we were collecting the name of the person who edited each tile, as well as uh, the username for each building outline that was edited. And so this enabled us to use ArcGIS dashboards to create what we called a leaderboard. Um, it kept track of the number of completed tiles, the number of tiles in progress, as well as um, kind of a graph of who was leading in terms of tiles edited or footprints edited. Great, and that kind of leads me to my next question for Omri. So Omri, the number of tiles edited we found was kind of unfair in a sense because some tiles had a few buildings in them and others had a lot of buildings in them. So Peyton, if you could zoom in a little bit to one of those footprints that shows that discrepancy. Um, Omri, can you talk to us a little bit about how we solved this problem? Yes, uh, thank you, Kim. Uh, so initially we created a fishnet based, based on a geographical area. And uh, you don't see here, but the initial uh, fishnet was five miles on five miles, which we relatively quick, we figure out that's going to be too much for one analyst. Uh, and then we we found out that even the even the fishnet that you see here is a little bit too big in the in the dense areas. So what we did, if I, I'm not sure you can see here on, in this slide, but on the less populated areas, we kept the original size of the grid, but in the more more highly uh, more highly dense population, we actually divided each grid into four subgrids in order to reduce the time for the analyst to spend on each grid. Um, lesson learned, uh, maybe we can create a fishnet not based on geographical area, but based on feature count per grid. Yeah, definitely if we're keeping track of who's quote winning in the uh, number of grids that they're completing, it, we certainly need to add fairness. And that for us was definitely a lesson learned. Um, it is also one of those things that gets down to motivation too. When you when you look at how many grids you're completing, it's 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 kind of fun to check them off. But when you get to a grid that seems like you're never going to finish, it's it's kind of deflating in a sense. So we really needed to figure out a way to help keep that volunteer motivated, um, but also get the job completed because we did have a discrete time that we needed to get this done. Um, well, well, thank you for that summary. Uh, Peyton, is there anything else you want to add about the hub? No, I don't think so. I think we How about have... adding users? That's one thing I think we might be interested in is we, we had a pretty interesting way of ensuring that when it came from the GIS score, they had a list of names and we were, add, we were able to add them to the hub, but, not, um, but keep it in a secure environment. Do you want to speak to that a little bit? Yeah, sure. So um, once volunteers indicated to your resident GIS Corps that they wanted to volunteer, we were sent their uh, first name, last name, and email address. We were then able to use that information to cre create an account in FEMA's uh, Hub Premium Community Organization. So this is a separate ArcGIS Online organization intended for community initiatives just like this. And so once the volunteers had an account, we could then create this Hub page and only share it with those volunteers. So the general public was not able to access this page. It's only accessible by the, the volunteers. And that's a really good, important point because we do have people who are checking out tiles and using their names and and so we did not want to share that with the general public so this even though you all can see this here this is not available to anyone to view um, but that also speaks to project planning you know you have to think through all those little details in order to make sure that your project is ready to go so that once you have that list of volunteers they have a place to do the work so it was one of those things that we had to really consider in advance of the kickoff for this. So with that said, I'd like to actually turn it back to you, Omri, and just give us a little summary of the result. What was the conclusion and how do we use this information once they completed the project? So I think we can see two major outcomes that came out of this project. Uh, first of all, I would call it 
uh, the operational outcome and we, we achieved the operational goal. We were able to uh, deliver better data for the artificial intelligent process for the LoRa event. And therefore we were able to provide faster, more accurate answers relate, regarding damage assessment. Uh, that moves forward from response to recovery. So when you actually save time on the initial steps, that saves a lot of time in the later steps. Uh, the second outcome is the bigger picture outcome. I would say that um, we're able to, by, by adjusting and making the data for LoRa better, we're able to take part of the bigger USA structure data and make it more accurate, make it better for any future needs, for any future events, for any future algorithm or processes. The better, the more people that look at the data, the better data we have for the future. Fabulous, well, thank you. Well, if anyone has any questions, you can certainly reach out to FEMA-crowdsourcing at FEMA.dhs.gov or to you can view GIS Corps' contact information on giscore.org. And thank you all for joining. We hope you have a great rest of your day. Look forward to hearing from you.